Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country, and it helps connect people to what NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. To find out about future webinars, you can look under the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education tab on our webpage, or just follow us on Facebook. This is our sixth webinar in a series designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of the incredible experts that work there during these weeks of school closures. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA. You'll hear me saying no NOAA quite a bit, and that stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to my friend, Dr. Genevieve Davis. And the reason I introduce her as Dr. Genevieve Davis is just this week, she became Dr. Davis, which is very exciting. So I know she can't hear or see you, but everyone give her a round of applause because it's very exciting. When I go into classrooms, I talk about being a junior scientist. And if you become really, really expert at what you do, you can become a senior scientist. So it's very exciting um, that that happened this week. She's going to talk to you all about studying marine mammals and sound. Now, just a few guidelines. I think most of you are familiar with this before I really turn it over to Jen. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want everyone to be able to hear. We do want to hear from you though. So there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you that, to ask them as we go and I will be keeping track for Jen. She will stop every now and then and answer a few. We won't get to everyone's questions, so I apologize for that, but we'll answer as many as we can. Depending on your device, how you access the question box may be different. For some of you, it might be a question mark on the bottom or the side of the screen. Others might have a little box on the side with an arrow, a, a little red arrow and a hand. Click on the arrow to show the question box. We'll not be using the raise hand function. Now, I like to share with you where folks are from because I think that's pretty exciting. So Jen, we have some people from Virginia. We have some people from Falmouth and Mashpee. That's where we're located. We have some people from New Brunswick, Canada, Ontario, Oregon, Woodstock, New Hampshire, Bozeman, Montana, Madison, Wisconsin, Fairfax, Maryland, Texas, Georgia, Plymouth, and I'm sure that just some because there were so many people, um, yeah, so many people weighing in. But I'm gonna and Colorado and Connecticut. But for now, I want to turn it over to Jen because she has some really exciting things to tell us about marine mammals and sound. So over to you, Jen. Thanks, Grace. Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is very exciting to be able to talk to you all uh, about my passion in life. And just so you know, I didn't know this passion existed when I was growing up. Uh, I was exposed to sound during an internship in college and marine mammals and fell in love with this work. And 10 years later, here I am. And so I'm hoping I can give you some of that love today. So before we start talking about sounds and listening to them, I think the most important thing to do is talk about hearing. And so we're gonna start with a hearing test. And one of the things with sound that you have to think about, so there's two main words that we talk about when we describe sound. There's amplitude, which is how loud or intense the sound is, and frequency, which is the pitch. So I want you to think if you're playing a piano and you have your keys, those lower keys are the lower frequencies and the higher keys up on the right, those are your higher frequencies. And then how hard you're pressing on those piano keys, that's how loud it is and that's the amplitude. So when we do our hearing test, we're gonna have to listen to different frequencies and I want you to see how high you can hear. And we're gonna play them as loud as we can. So we're hoping you're going to be able to. And I want you, when you can no longer hear your frequency, when I tell you how loud, what the frequency range it is, Put that into the question box, and Grace is gonna keep track of how high you can hear. Okay, so here we start. This is eight kilohertz. Okay, we're gonna move on to 10 kilohertz. Hopefully you can hear that. We're gonna to go to 12 kilohertz. Moving on to 14. Okay, now we're gonna end up closer to the end of my hearing range. This is 16 kilohertz. I can't hear that anymore. This is 18 kilohertz. Can anyone still hear? 
We're going to go to 20 kilohertz. Okay, and now we're going to go to the maximum range. This is going to be 22 kilohertz. Okay, so enter in your box the highest frequency range you could hear. So, oh, so, so just to share with you the results, I'm kind of looking at them. A lot of folks, it was about 18 kilohertz where they stopped. Some people said 20. Um, a few, a few, there were a few at each range, but it seems like the majority of them were 18 kilohertz. And just while people are still putting in their results, I just had a question about amplitude um, and uh, about pitch and frequency. So when you think about amplitude and you think about loudness. I was just really loud, wasn't I? And when you think about pitch, the, Jen was talking about the low pitch sounds. If everyone wants to make a low pitch sounds, and if anyone wants to make a high, uh, elementary school students are much better at making high pitch sounds than I am. That's your pitch is, is how, how deep or how high pitched it is. Um, so yep, so it looks like everybody, some people were disappointed they couldn't hear it after the first one, don't worry about it. As we get older, our hearing does uh, drop off, um, but a lot of folks said 18, 18 to 20. So there you go, those are your results. Great, um, and so one thing to keep in mind is as we get older, our hearing, range, our hearing range does change and it gets smaller. So you might, if you had an adult in the room with you, they might not be able to hear as high as you can, or you might find that as you get older, your range is no longer as good as it used to be. Okay, so we just talked about humans and what we can hear, but I want you to think, what do you hear when you go outside? So right now, if I were to go outside, I might hear the rain, so I would know what weather is occurring. I might hear cars going by. On a nice day, I might hear the birds chirping. Uh, and if you're in the city, maybe you hear sirens, or you might hear lots of cars. So depending on where you are, you have a different background noise that you hear. Now I want you to think, and before you look too closely at this picture, I want you to type in the question box, what do you think you hear if you stuck your head underwater and went out in the ocean to listen? What would we hear? Okay, I'm gonna share them with you as they come in. So Regan is saying that you might hear boats and David is saying that you might hear um, whooshing. Some folks are saying ships. Some folks are saying, Rebecca said water, the ocean. You might hear waves or whales. Uh, you might hear animals. Okay, someone has seen this before. We said, someone said air gun. Clicking noises. Um, bubbles. Voices from above the water. Maybe a splashing fish. Uh, and bubbles from if you're exhaling, if you're breathing while you're underwater. So I think that, and maybe a motor. Someone said you might hear a motor. Excellent. That's great. That really captures everything we're hearing. So if we do look at the next slide, everything that this is talking about is the soundscape and all the different sounds that we're hearing under sea. So you can hear animals. So there's the biological sounds. There's the anthropogenic, which is human-caused sounds, which many people mention. So ship noise, seismic surveying, which is air guns when we go looking for oil under the ocean floor. Uh, we heard waves, so there could be wave energy, and you can hear the movement of water. Environment, so whether it's stormy out and it may be really loud. Uh, then there's other sounds that can come from the bottom of the seafloor, so volcanic activity, earthquakes. Uh, and then we talked about animals. So marine mammals make sounds, and we'll look at a bunch of those, as well as invertebrates uh, and fish. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, we can actually hear some of these sounds. We're gonna start with some environmental sounds. This is called ice calving, which is sounds kind of like an earthquake. It might be hard. This is a cool sound. This is um, a phenomenon from ice when it's rubbing against itself. So 
that's a sound from nature. It might sound kind of like a siren to you. Now we're gonna try, this is an air gun. So this is when we're looking for oil on the bottom of the ocean, seeing if we can find it. So I want you to think of how that would sound outside your home all the time consistently if humans are trying to find oil. And this is just an example of a vessel, so one of our boats that makes noise. <coughs> Okay, so there's lots of different boats that make noise. That's one of them. So we listen to some environmental sounds. We listen to some anthropogenic sounds, so human-caused sounds. And we're going to look at some marine mammal sounds for, uh, soon. But first, I want to talk about why marine mammals make sound. Why is it important? So, Jen, can I just step in here really quick? Because some folks were saying they wanted to hear some of the sounds over again. And I know Jen was going to mention this later. but. If you go to the um, website, the NOAA Live website where Jen's webinar is listed, you'll see underneath that there is a link to a sound page. All of the sounds that you hear today, you can go visit and listen to the sounds on your computer. You'll probably hear them louder, but also it gives you a chance if you aren't hearing everything you want to hear. We won't be playing sounds a second time, but you can go there afterwards and listen. And um, folks, a, a couple of people asked, so could you just explain again um, what an air gun is, because I think they were wondering. Yep. So um, when we go to look to get oil out of the bottom of the ocean floor, air gun is the machine we use to blast sound into the floor to listen and see if there's oil there. And so it just produces a really loud sound, and it's how we look to see if that's a place where we want to find oil. Okay. So. Um, if everyone can close your eyes and try and think of the game when it's summertime and we're all able to be around each other again, and when you play Marco Polo. So think about that game, think about how you play it. What you do is the main person closes their eyes and they say Marco, and you're listening to people around you saying Polo, right? And so you're trying to find someone without using your vision, but using your ears. And so this is how marine mammals use sound. It's just like playing Marco Polo. So if you imagine living underwater, it's very hard to see because light doesn't go very far. So often you're surrounded by darkness. And many of our marine mammals therefore have to rely on sound rather than sight. And they often use it just like we use vision. And so we'll go through all the different ways that they're using it. So if you close your eyes, I want you to imagine what you can do right now. How can you see what's going on? You might hear your dog snoring next to you. You might hear someone in the household cooking and making a meal. You might be able to smell the meal. Um, so you can use sound to understand what's going on without having to look all the time. Okay. And so what's really interesting about sound is that it travels really far underwater. So if you can imagine your habitat is suddenly the ocean, your home is the entire ocean. How do you communicate across this large space? So sometimes a whale in good conditions, if it's calling near Newfoundland, Canada, which is that orange circle up top, it could be heard all the way down in Bermuda, which is that green circle down there. And this is looking at the entire North American continent. So that's really far. And not only can it travel far, but it travels faster. So sound can travel five times faster underwater than it can in air. Okay, so what do you think, before we go there, what do you think marine mammals use sound for? Can anyone enter in the question box what you think they might communicate for? Oops, I just gave one away. So let's see, Jennifer said that they use sound for finding food. Uh, oh, someone said their dog doesn't snore. She was saying that because my dog is snoring next to me. <laughs> Yeah, Christine said it's to communicate. Andrew said it's to find prey. Annabelle said finding food. We have a bunch of people saying communication. Oh, Gabe said echolocation. I love that word. Um, someone said mating uh, for communicating with other animals. That was Noah. 
and to find each other, searching, um, finding danger through echolocation. Let's see, to see where other whales are and their food. Yeah, to ask for help, warnings, finding their babies, navigating. I think that's a pretty good list. That's an impressive list. So if you look, you're all right. Everything you said was perfect. Marine mammals use sound for communicating. So that can be finding other species, finding mates. A lot of male uh, baleen whales, which we'll look a little closer at in a second, uh, use this really cool long pattern song to display to find a mate. Uh, it can be for mom and calves to stay in communication and stay close. Um, you can use it for predator warning. You can also next look for food, like many mentioned, and someone used that awesome word of echolocation. If, uh, just click next, great. Thanks. So for finding prey, so we can send a sig uh, toothed whales, which we'll also look at closer in a little bit, can send a signal out and receive it with sound to be able to see where the food is uh, and find it. And someone also mentioned navigation, which is perfect because they also use sound for that. And a lot of our whales are traveling really long distances throughout the year. And so they're using sound to understand where they are and find other species as they go into different areas. So uh, we did a little bit of a hearing test to understand our frequency ranges. Um, and marine mammals also have a really different vocal ranges that they're communicating with and also hearing ranges as well. And so different marine mammals use different um, calls for different purposes. And we just talked about a bunch. So whether it's to find other species, uh, find species within their group and do food. Each one has a specific hearing range and frequency range that they're communicating over. So typically our larger whales are communicating over a lower frequency. So remember those are our lower piano keys or as Grace showed us those low frequencies. And some of our smaller animals or toothed whales are typically communicating over higher frequencies, a lot of times way beyond our human hearing range. And so this is showing you, for example, harbor porpoises, which are one of our tiny toothed animals. Um, they have ultrasonic clicks, which mean way beyond our human hearing range. So we can't hear what they do. Okay. So we talked about what makes underwater sound. We're gonna go into some examples now to see the differences between our different species. And so as you're listening, I want you to think, how can you tell them apart? Do they sound different? Are they communicating in higher ranges or lower ranges? Um, and can you start to tease them apart? So we're gonna start with toothed whales, and then we're gonna listen to a baleen whale, and then we'll listen to a seal, and then a fish. And as we do this, I want you to think. So I'm going to play these examples for you first, and then we're going to play a game. And I'm going to ask you what you think is making that sound. So as you listen to these, see if you can start to pull differences. So if you remember from Allison and Grace's talks earlier uh, last week, they showed you examples of all these different kinds of whales. Okay, so this is going to be a killer whale, which is our tooth whale. And Grace was holding up teeth in case you missed it, of a sperm whale and I believe a harbor uh, dolphin. 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 Oh. This is just to remind you the first sound Jen is playing for you are toothed whales or odonocetes. So these are some of the teeth you would have seen. So I will play that sound for you. Okay, and again, if you couldn't hear that well, which you might not have, the website has all of these sounds, so you can go and listen to them later. So now we're going to listen to a humpback whale, which is a, a baleen whale. Oh. 
All right, so now what do we think? Was that higher or lower than a killer whale? Was the baleen oil frequency range higher, higher, or lower than the O'Donoghue? But we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Uh, everybody, uh, the majority of people are saying that the humpback was a lower frequency or a lower pitch sound than the um, orca. Oh, you guys are doing great. So that's typical. Baleen whales are often in our lower frequency ranges, and our odonocetes are in our higher frequency ranges. And that's a baleen whale. All right, so next we're going to go to pinnipeds or seals and listen to an example. This is a bearded seal. Okay, what do you think that sounded like? How is that different from the others? Folks are saying that they thought that it sounded um, higher pitched. It, some people thought it sounded like a whale. Uh, oh, Cindy's dogs did not like that sound at all. <laughs> uh, someone thought it sounded like a balloon deflating, but they all seem to think that it was a higher, higher pitched uh, sound. Yeah, and so I also think seals often sound kind of like a science fiction movie coming through. So, and it's even been, um, they've even used one, I think, in a Star Wars movie, right, Grace? Was that? They have used different marine mammal sounds for um, different sci-fi. I don't know if they actually used it, but you'll see one of the one of the animals, I won't tell you which one, sounds a lot like a lightsaber. Hmm. There we go, we might see that later. Uh, okay, and so now we heard an adonisite, a mysticite, and a pinniped, and now we're going to listen to a fish. And this is haddock. What do fish sound like? Are they different or the same? So thought, um, folks thought that it was lower. Um, someone thought it sounded like a weird, uh, a woodpecker, sorry. Um, a lot of people think that it sounded low pitched, like a knock on the door, a little bit um, in between, I guess, frequencies between the um, really low humpback and the higher pitched orca. And, okay. yep, some people thought it sounded like a heartbeat. Great. So fish are, are even lower frequencies than a lot of our baleen whales are on equal um, frequency ranges as baleen whales. So we've got fish and baleen whales really low, and then seals and odonoseeds kind of in the next category. So nice. I love all of your answers. You're doing great. Now we're going to play a game. So I've trained all of you. You're now my junior bio bioacousticians, which we didn't go over that word yet, did we? What do you think a bioacoustician is? Or bioacoustics? Hmm. Bioacoustics. Think about the bio part of it and the acoustics. Someone said they thought it was math related with sound. Uh, Lilia said she thought it was identifying sounds from living things. Uh, bio means life, someone said. Liza thinks it's someone who studies sound. Cup, a couple of people think that. Yeah, so perfect. So an acoustician is someone who just studies sound, uses sound of science. And bioacoustics is using biology, the biology of sounds. So how do how does life use sound? So you guys did great. That's perfect. Okay. So after that, now that you're my bioacousticians, 
I'm gonna play you a mystery sound. And I want you to think as you're listening what it sounds like. So remember, remember those species we were just listening to. Uh, and if you can guess based on just listening, whether you think it's a odonacy, so remember a toothed whale, a mystacy, a baleen whale, or a pinniped, a seal, and you can just say tooth baleen or seal if you want. I want you to put that in the question box. If you wanna wait, I'm gonna give you three facts after we play the sound that can help you guess which one it is. And then we're gonna look at what possible species it comes from. Uh, and then I'll tell you after that. So we're first gonna listen to the sound and remember you can put in your answer at any point. And just before I play the sound, I want to make the point, Akira had a really great comment, and she said, you can look at the graph, this is actually called a spectrogram, and you can you can sort of cheat a little bit by looking at what the frequency or the pitch is, if you look at it along the y-axis here, this is just time on the x-axis, and then the colors are the amplitude or the loudness, right, Jen? So I just want to Excellent thing to notice. Yeah, so we're looking at spectrograms, and spectrograms are a visual way we can look at sound. And I'm so sorry I didn't explain that earlier. Nope, Great. that's one of the team. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so remember, I want you to think if you think it's a tooth whale, a baleen whale, or a seal. Okay. And if okay. Is, oh, yeah. Go ahead. I was like, we can start reading clues if we want before you've guessed, or we can do both. I have a lot of guesses, so let me just share with you. And I just want to apologize that Kira um, is a young gentleman, so I apologize for that. Um, so a lot of folks are saying seal. We have a few uh, toothed whales. But a lot of folks are saying, um, so it's, 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 it's sort of split between the two. And then there are a few baby emails. Great. So. Let's read some clues and see if that clears anything up. So this animal eats squid and fish. Adults grow up to eight feet. So that's like one and a half to two humans, about my height, and weigh up to 440 pounds, which is hopefully a lot more than two of me. And they're found around Antarctica. Okay, see if you can answer now what you think this animal might be. So we're still we're we're still seeing um, well we're seeing I think predominantly seals, but okay. there are a few folks that think um, that it's a a to toothed cetacean as well. Great. You want me to show choices? Yeah, show the choices, please. Okay, what do we think this is? Beluga whale, right whale, or Ross seal? All right, it's coming. Uh, it's uh, it's split between Ross se seal and beluga whale. There All right, seems let's see what it is. Yeah. A Ross seal, and I. But if you listened again to, we have a beluga whale example on our website, so you can go and listen to the, the two together. All right, let's do another one. And you can um, look at Kira's clues by looking at what frequency ranges these sounds are in too, but let's listen. Okay, so I want you guys to enter what you think. Do you think it's a toothed whale, a baleen whale, or a seal? 
Grace, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Thank you. I keep forgetting the switch. So just a shout out. I've got a lot of folks that have been voting in and just a shout out. Annabelle, Gabe, Regan, Dylan, and Tati have all said that they think it's a baleen whale. A lot of folks have voted for a baleen whale. And I have to tell you, Jen, someone even had the correct type of baleen whale. I'm not going to say what it is, but okay. somebody did have the correct one. Well, let's read some facts about this animal. This animal eats tiny zooplankton, primarily copepods. Adults grow up to 55 feet and weigh up to 70 tons, which is like seven school buses. And they're now highly endangered. Their name comes from the reason they were hunted in such high numbers. So someone may have already guessed this. What do we think? Do you want me to tell you what the guesses are? I would love to hear the guesses. All right, so we have uh, Victor thinks it's a blue whale. Katie thinks it's a right whale. Annabelle thinks it's a right whale. Juliet thinks it's a humpback whale. Uh, Sloan thinks it's a right whale. Sophia thinks it's a right whale. Catherine thinks it's a right whale. We have a lot of right whale folks. So those are all great guesses. The majority in this case does win. So that was a right whale. So you may have learned a lot about right whales previously from Alice and in Grace, um, and that's fantastic. We have a few more things about them, uh, but they have really specific calls called an up call. That's their contact call, and that's like saying, hey, how are you? Uh, and my research primarily focuses on right whales and using their acoustics to tell where they are. So they're very special to my heart. So Jen, can we pause here for a second and can I share some of the questions that have come in so that you can answer some of the questions? Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting questions um, that I would love to hear you answer is, can humans hear marine mammal sounds? So just with our ears, if we were to listen underwater, would we be able to hear them? Yeah, if they're um, close enough and loud enough. So if you, I have not had the pleasure of doing it, but many people have told me they've gone snorkeling in Hawaii near humpback whales and they're able to hear them everywhere. And so that sounds wonderful. Um, but you can, if they are close and loud enough, you can hear them. Great. Another weird qu question we had is, how does whale sound help with navigation? Great question. Um, so they can use cues like understanding if they're too close to shore, perhaps if there's waves that are slamming into the cliffs um, and that type of thing. They can also just use it as, the, as they're navigating. They can tell when they're in an area with other animals. So a lot of times, like the right whale, you just heard some of the up calls. You'll hear them calling as they come into an area to see if other species are around. And um, someone wanted to know, uh, Ellen wanted to know, what's your favorite whale? It's a great question. Um, I unfortunately am biased, and my favorite whale is the right whale, and that's probably because I started studying them and have continued studying them throughout my career. But I also love all of them, and when you see them in person, it's hard not to like just one. Um, I think my favorite ones to see are pilot whales, but I get excited about every single one of them. And somebody else, I don't know if you can answer this, somebody asked which whale can hear the best. Oh, you know, that's a great question. So we talked about human hearing ranges. Uh, and with whale hearing ranges, it's a little more tricky because we can't necessarily take them into a lab and do a hearing test on them like we can for humans or some dolphins we can do hearing range tests on. Um, so typically, we think that most whales can hear within the range that they can communicate. But I don't know if we know which one has the best hearing range. Or so I think uh, one more question and then we'll move on. And the last question I wanted to ask you that came through is Maisie uh, and Miles wanted to know, when did you first get interested in studying sound? 
Great question. I got interested in studying sound uh, in college when I did an internship. So I didn't know that whales produced sound before then. I didn't know it was a thing we could use to help whales. Uh, and I originally wanted to be a veterinarian in my life and came across this work, fell in love with it, and then um, continued on after school. So it's been about 11 years now. I was 21. And I just want to clarify because some people were asking questions and we talked about this in one of our previous talks because uh, you mentioned pilot whales. When we use the term whale, someone want, made the point that they're porpoises. When we use the term whale, it's sort of like saying something is a bug. It's a very general term and it can mean really any of the animals in the cetacean group, depending yes. on who you're talking to. I should be more specific and say cetaceans. That would be far more accurate. Sorry, um, didn't mean to pick on you for that. I appreciate getting picked on. Should we do one more test? Yes, let's do one. All right, what do we think? Is it a donacete, toothed whale, mysticete, baleen whale, or pinniped seal? So uh, there were quite a few people that said that they thought it was a, well, it seems to be mixed between a toothed whale, whale and a seal. That okay. seems, some, this sounds really weird. It does. Um, sound. And sounds like a bell, but we have a lot of either pinnipeds or toothed whales. Excellent. Let's read some facts. This animal eats mollusks, clams, and other invertebrates. Adults grow up to 10 and a half feet, so definitely two or more humans, and weigh up to 2,700 pounds, far more than two humans. And they rely on thick packs of ice for resting and giving birth. So they have to come out of the water to rest and give birth. We see three possible species that it could be. Well, so I want to just tell you that overwhelmingly, most people think that it's a, a seal. Okay, great. Let's see. Could it be a walrus, a polar bear, or a sperm whale? All right, the votes are coming in, and it is overwhelmingly, well, the majority say that they think it's the walrus. Okay, let's see, what is it? It's a walrus. Nice job, everybody. Very impressed with all of your skills. Okay, so now that we've heard all of these sounds that marine mammals make, and we know how important it is for them to communicate. I want you to think about what we as humans are adding as sound into the ocean. So what do we put into the ocean now as sound sources? And how do you think that affects marine mammals? So enter in the question box first, what do you think we're doing to produce sound in the ocean? Uh, James thinks that we're putting boat sounds in and Sam thinks that as well. Uh, Lilia thinks we do drilling. Cindy thinks that we do bomb testing. Uh, oil exploration, Ellen showed. Uh, air guns, Brody uh, shared that. Sonar from Toby and Joshua. Motors from Diana. Boat horns. Windmills from Noah. Yeah. Uh, oh. Nope, go ahead. That's great. Those are all all sources of sound that we're adding into the ocean. And when you say vessels, I want you to think about all the different types of vessels that we have. We have fishing boats, we have uh, pleasure boats for going out for fun, we have commercial boats, so pretty much everything that we have from other countries comes here on a ship. Um, and so there's lots of different boats that are adding sound into the ocean, as well as all those other things you guys were mentioning. 
So with all of this, what do you think that does to marine mammals? How does that affect them? So Brody thinks that the sounds might confuse the animals. And let's see. Yep, um, Annabelle thinks that it might overwhelm them. A lot of folks actually are saying that it might confuse them or frighten them. Um, or overload them. Brody says that might, a different Brody, that it might overload them with sound. Um, someone said it might interrupt their migration path. Um, confuse, distract, psychological damage. So I think that that kind of yeah, covers it. Yep. That, that covers all of it. Um, I mean, so the main things that sound can do, our input of sound is the ocean. We can cause hearing loss or injury. So I don't know if your parents ever told you not to listen to your music so loud because it can cause hearing damage. The same idea is what we're doing to marine mammals um, with sound addition. It can change the behavior. So if you were listening to a really loud sound, sometimes you might want to walk away because that's really annoying. So it might change where they're going. Uh, or it can prevent them from hearing important sounds. So maybe they can't communicate with each other as well, because it's really hard to talk over a loud sound. If you're in a city and you're trying to talk on your phone and you have sirens going by all the time, I don't know if you've experienced it, but I often have a hard time hearing who I'm trying to talk to. So it's the same idea. And so we want to make sure in my lab that the sounds that we're making don't cause these issues, where we try and study to see how we can uh, manage our effect on marine mammals and reduce the amount of ocean noise that we're putting in there and understand how our sounds are impacting them. So we use what's called passive acoustic monitoring, which is basically we can put recorders out underwater and listen. And there's a lot of different kinds of information we can get from it. We can understand things like movement of animals uh, and the timing of where and when they are. So where are they showing up in our waters? And for how long are they showing up in these different areas? We can understand things like distance to shore. So how close to shore are they traveling? Or are they really further offshore? And then how is that overlapping with human activity? We can understand things like all of the animals that are calling. So what's really great about acoustics is you can record anything that's vocalizing. So we can get all baleen whales that are calling when they come by. We can get fish, we can get vessels. Um, so you're able to really capture a lot from sound and understand what's happening. So Jen, I just wanna briefly go back because a few people are asking the picture that we had in the past, the previous slide with the animals that were on the beach. They're just wondering what happened um, right. to the animals. I'll go back to that slide for you. Yes, thank you. So these are pictures that are showing strandings. And so this is when there's some really loud sounds um, that can cause hearing damage um, to the point where animals get stranded because they either die from the um, hearing damage or they get confused and get washed up ashore and then they, they strand there. So um, sound, loud sound and impactful sound can have a really big impact on them. And that's why we have to look and manage uh, the sounds that we're putting out into the ocean. Anyone else have any questions? Um, so we have a couple of questions here. So someone's wondering if there's data that shows a general change in behavior due to human actions, like how far back we have passive acoustic monitoring data. Yeah, we do. There's a lot of studies that have looked at uh, human effects. Um, acoustics is a relatively newer technology compared to some of the other ones, but we do have recorders that are from the 60s and 70s. Uh, but within the last 20 years, it's been really when it's taken off and we've really been able to start looking at sound in the ocean. Um, so Laura wants to know if there are any rules or regulations on sound pollution in the ocean. Yeah, it's getting better. Um, it's definitely not the most common rules out there. Um, there's a lot of other things we're looking at too, like um, fishing gear and ship strikes, so trying to slow speeds down. Uh, but there are rules that are trying to reduce the amount of noise that each ship is putting out there or trying to reduce 
when we're producing noise, so when we're looking to develop areas and do those things like pile driving, um, we try and not overlap with when important species are going to be in the area. Okay, uh, thanks. And I'm going to just uh, shout out a few answers to some things that came through. Katie asked if walruses have live birth. They do. Um, Sam asked, what animal is the lightsaber? And I encourage you, Sam, to go listen to the fin whale. And um, Bridget wants to know how long you've been working uh, at the lab. So I'm going to let you answer that one. I've been at the lab for nine years now. And um, another question that came in from Catherine is, do all of the beached whales, the ones that are on the shore, do they get there because of sound problems or are there other reasons they might be um, beaching themselves? There can be other reasons. Um, there have been some cases where it's been due to military action. There have been some cases where it's due to different diseases that species have um, come across. So there's lots of different reasons that you'll find a stranded animal or mass strandings. We call them uh, unusual mortality events when that happens. Great. And this is a question from early on, but um, it's been asked a couple of times, so I thought I'd share with you. How do you find oil by hearing? I think they were, they were curious. A lot of folks were curious about the air gun, and so they were just wondering how you would locate oil using sound. Mm. How to locate oil? So, so I'll take that one. Um, I think the the point is that um, sound travels differently through air versus liquid versus solids. So when they're sending sound down through the seafloor, they're looking for that change because oil is a um, a liquid versus the solid seafloor, so it will do different things to the sound. And that's, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jen, but I think perfect. that's what they were asking about. Yep, perfect answer. Um, and another question that they had was, let's see. Hmm, sorry, I'm looking through to see. They were just wondering, if we have any statistics or any numbers for how many am animals do get impacted by sound? And I know that's probably a tough question, but. That's a great question. I don't have that answer off the top of my head. I bet we could look at some of the stranding reports, but we don't have, um, they, they're not able to always understand all of the reasons for stranding. So if there's a lot of them and there's a, uh, in an area where we have the resources to be able to do things like a necropsy, which is looking to investigate why an animal died. Um, that would be when we can find out, but they can't do that for every stranding. So I don't think we have accurate numbers for that, unfortunately. Okay, a few other questions. Do all of these animals, because we talked so much about them using their hearing, do they have eyes? Great question. They do have eyes. Uh, they may not work as well as our eyes, but yes, they all have eyes um, and they can all see. They just are often in areas where light doesn't reach, so they're switching to hearing instead. And this is a question that is a throwback from a couple of webinars, again, which we never answered. Why is a whale shark called a whale shark when it's not really a whale? That's a good question. Do you want me to answer that, or do you want to answer that? Uh, I can answer it, um, and you can you can add to it if you want. Because I'm glad that someone asked this, and the reason I'm glad is because I think a lot of times people think that it is a um, type of whale, but it's actually a shark. A shark is not a mammal. Um, they have gills. They have a skeleton made out of cartilage instead of bone, but they're called a whale shark because they're really large and they look a little bit like a whale and the way they feed, they're filtering similar to our baleen whales. Well, they're filtering. So a lot of times folks, um, you know, name things because they're similar to other animals. So even though they're not really a whale, that's why they're called a whale shark. Is that good? They look like one. Yeah, I think the look alike is, is the main key. Okay, and one last question, because then we are out of time, but uh, I'm going to ask this question of you, Jen, because if you've seen uh, Finding Dory, 
I think everyone is familiar with the beluga whale that was there. So Marta was asking, do beluga whales use their large head? I'm going to just open this question. There, do beluga whales use their large head for bouncing sound off of them? So if you could explain beluga whales and, and talk about the melon, that would be great. Yeah. So beluga whales are an odontocete. So they're a toothed whale, and they use echolocation to be able to tell where things are and what's in front of them. So they send a sound out through their melon, which is kind of a big fat ball at the top of their head that they can directly send a signal in a certain direction and understand where it's going. And then they can receive that signal back and understand where things are. So if you saw Finding Dormy, Dory, you'll remember the beluga did echolocate in a way and saw a picture come back. And it's not quite exactly how Finding Dory showed it, but it's similar in the idea that they can send a sound out and they receive what's back in their head kind of like a picture, so they can tell what's around them. That answers your Finding Dory question. Similar, but not exactly the same. So that was really great. I want to thank you, Jen. It was really neat to hear about marine mammals and sound and learn all about the different types of vocalizations or sounds they make. I want to remind everyone that you can go and listen to the sounds. If you go to the NOAA Live website, there is a link um, also on our resources page, we have a, a, a square that says sounds and you click on that, it takes you right to the sounds page. You can listen to any sounds maybe that you heard today you want to hear again, or maybe there's a species you're really interested in that you didn't get to hear today. You'll find that there are a lot of different species. So thanks so much for taking the time to share your amazing research with us, Jen. I encourage everyone who wants to, on Monday, our next webinar is about sail drones, which are really, really neat. You might think about drones that fly through the sky. Well, um, Heather is going to talk to us about drones that sail across the ocean, how they study um, the ocean and the atmosphere, and it looks like a, a little sailboat. So really, really neat, the sail drones talk. So that will be at 11. Um, go ahead and register at the same place, still on our NOAA Live website. But thanks so much for uh, tuning in with us, and stay tuned for next week. We have some really exciting webinars. So thank you so much, Jen, and thank you all for coming and listening. Yeah.